right, thank you very much. Great to be here in Texas. And uh, I'm going to continue talking to you a little bit about the Hebrew origins of the Lord's Prayer. I really only touched on a very small part of it. And even after uh, you know, this, this pr uh, presentation, it will be a, a very small part of it. There's so much deepness and richness once you get into the Hebrew. Uh, over here I have a, a picture of another manuscript of Hebrew Matthew. Before we saw one from the British Library. This one is from Florence, Italy. And here we can see the second line of the prayer. It starts, Our Father in Heaven, and that says in Hebrew, Yit Kadesh Shimcha. Say, Yit Kadesh Shimcha. And that's really a powerful statement because in English we usually translate that, Hallowed be thy name. Which, what does that really mean, Hallowed be thy name? It's kind of like this vague statement, Your name is holy. But when you look at it in Hebrew and in Greek, the Hebrew and Greek here are identical. It means literally, May your name be sanctified which grammatically is a call to action. And Keith is going to talk more about that. I won't steal his thunder. But may your name be sanctified is a call to action. It, it begs the question, if we're sanctifying the name of our Heavenly Father, what is his name? What is the name of, of our Heavenly Father? And that's what the prayer is too, our Father in Heaven. And uh, about a year ago, I was speaking at this, uh, to this group of, of uh, charismatic prayer warriors and some of them, they were praying in tongues, and they were all over the place. And one lady was praying uh, with Hebrew names. She was calling upon the Father using various Hebrew names. And when I was presenting on this, I, I said, okay, I'm going to pick on her and ask her, what, uh, ma'am, is the name of our Father in heaven? And she said, well, is it El Shaddai? Is it El Elyon? And she threw out a whole bunch of titles. Those are beautiful, wonderful titles of, of the king of creation. But he, he only has one name. And that is a name that he gave uh, and revealed to Moses, when Moses asked the exact same question, what is the name that I should tell the Israelites? You've appeared to me in the burning bush, said go to the Israelites, and I'm going to say the God of our forefathers has appeared to me. I need to be more specific. And why is that? Because their forefathers worshipped lots of gods. It says that when uh, Terach and Nahor, the f fathers of Abraham, were across the, the river, they had many, many gods. And in Egypt there were many, many gods. There was Ra, and there was Baal from uh, Canaan. And there were more gods than we could possibly count. So Abraham, or excuse me, Moses, when he uh, appears before God at the burning bush, he says, God, what name should I tell them? And the answer comes in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, there God, it says, the, uh, God says, thus shall you say to the children of Israel. And then we have this four-letter name. And uh, as Keith says, when we get to this name, a lot of people will shut down. They'll say, there's controversy. I don't want to deal with this because there's different opinions on how to pronounce this name. Uh, in the earliest Hebrew manuscripts that evolves, it's written Yehovah. Some people say it's Yahweh or Yahuwah. And I've actually been invited to speak at some places, and they said, you, we want to hear you speak. You have so many things for us that we need to hear, but only if you pronounce the name Yahweh or some other pronunciation. And, uh, you know, I mean, everybody has a theory out there, and a lot of them will say, if you don't pronounce it this exact way, then you have lost your salvation. Lake of fire for you if you don't pronounce it our way. And I'm not coming up here and telling you you have to pronounce the God's name this particular way or that particular way. I say search it out for yourself. Study it for yourself. Keith Johnson has a great book. Uh, he'll talk about his hell name revealed again. Amazing book. Goes into some evidence. But at the end of the day, you need to work it out for yourself in fear and trembling with prayer and study. Uh, Again, I've said, based on the earliest Hebrew manuscripts, I pronounce it Yehovah. If you want to replace that with Yahweh, knock yourselves out. God said to Moses, Thus you say to the children of Israel, Yehovah, or Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial for every generation. Now, how do I know this name is still relevant today? And again, I don't want opinions or theories. Based on this verse... How do I know that the name is still relevant today in the 21st century? Because maybe that name was only relevant for the answer that God was giving Moses at that very moment. Maybe what he was saying to Moses is right now when you go to the Israelites, tell them this name, and tomorrow I'll have some other name. How do I know it's still relevant today based on the verse? It says forever. Are we still in forever? I think we are, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, last time I checked. And the word for Hebrew phrase forever is actually two words, le olam, say le olam which literally means for, olam, uh, we translate it as forever, but what it literally means is the universe. And what you're saying when you say le olam is, for the duration of the universe, as long as heaven and earth continue to exist, this will be true. That's what le olam means. And he's saying as long as the universe continues to exist, and after it uh, ceases to exist, it won't 
really be of much interest to us because um, we'll be dead, but, and so will all of our descendants. But forever, for the existence of the universe, this is my name forever and for every generation. And we're still in every generation, the last I checked as well. Now, when I was studying this with Keith, he kept asking that same question. He said, I shook the tree, nothing fell out. How do I know this is relevant for my people? And we looked in scripture to find the answer. Don't want opinions. And here's what we found. Many verses, but this is one, one in particular. Psalm 148, 11 to 13. It says, kings of the earth and all peoples. Say all peoples. All peoples. Kings of the earth and all peoples. Princes and ju all judges of the earth. Both young men and maidens. Old men and children. Let them praise the name of Jehovah. For his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. This is in my Bible as a Jew. And this is in your Bible as Christians, Messianics. This is in all of our Bibles. Now, if you look in a lot of your Bibles, you won't see this, though. You'll see that in place of the name, Yehovah or Yahweh, it'll say Lord. Now, why is that? Uh, and a lot of people will ask me, why isn't this in my Bible? Now, this is uh, the title page of the original 1611 King James Version as it actually descended down from the clouds of heaven. And <laughs> that's how it was written, right? No. Oh. That's what, I, that's what I was told. Um, anyway, this is the original 1611 King James Version, the title page. And if you look here, you can see the biblical world as it was understood by the translators. Over here, we have Mo, uh, Aaron with the breastplate and Moses with the Ten Commandments, the tablets. Up here is the lamb. What does that represent? You sound not sure. What? Okay. Up here is this bird, this dove. What does that represent? And up here, the Father in heaven, up in the clouds... It says Yehovah in Hebrew. This is an enlarged uh, picture of it. it. It actually says Yehovah on the cover page of the 1611 King James Version. So if somebody tells you, well, it doesn't appear in my English Bible. In my Bible, it only says Lord. Tell them in the original one from 1611, it had it on the title page. Now, it does is preserved in seven places in the King James. Uh, and in those verses, the translators decided if we write here Lord, it won't make any sense. Uh, for example, Psalm 83, verse 18, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, and remember in 1611, uh, if, you, if you're aware of this, in 1611, the J was interchangeable with the I, and it's actually spelled six times with a J, once with an I, so they would have read this as Jehovah back in 1611, which is pretty close, difference of nuance of pronunciation, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, are the most high over all the earth. Now here they realize if we write the Lord, it'll change his name, and it won't make any sense. Uh, which is exactly what many translators have done. Like the NIV, which is, of course, uh, the nearly inspired version we've said, uh, they've written the Lord, and most translations have replaced it with the Lord, changing the name, the eternal name of our Father. Now, to be fair, what they did is they wrote it in capital letters, and if you read the introduction to your Bible, who here reads the introduction to their Bible? I mean, we could barely get people to read the Bible. What, you know, the introduction, most people don't read it. There's a few... There's, an old, there's a saying in Hebrew, a, a few righteous men in Sodom. So we've got a few righteous men in Arlington here, but most of you are not reading the introduction, and I don't blame you. Uh, and so I think it's actually kind of misleading, but they do tell you, if you read the fine print, that it originally is the name Yehovah or Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, they call it, the four-letter name. And uh, that four-letter name, which in Hebrew is four letters, Yud, say Yud. yud. Hey, hey. Vav, Vav. Hey. That's the four-letter name of the Father. Uh, it appears in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament, 6,000, say 6,000, 800, and 28. 6,828 times. That's on my Bible, on average, seven times per page, depending on the size of your font and everything. But seven times per page is a lot. It's about 1,000 pages. That, that, that's actually more than all the titles put together, more than Lord and Lord actually legitimately appears as Adonai in the Hebrew. Adonai is the Hebrew for master or Lord. Uh, it appears Elohim, God. El Shaddai appears. El Elyon, Most High God. I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. And those legitimate titles uh, appear less altogether than the name of the Father himself, 6,828 times. Now that's obviously an important name, isn't it? I would think so. Sounds important. He likes to hear his name. He says it a lot. Um, <clears throat> now, the reason we don't say the name and see it in our English Bibles is our English translators learned how to translate Hebrew from Jewish rabbis. And the rabbis taught them a tradition I was raised with, that whenever you see the name of our Heavenly Father, yud heh vav -Heh, which appears in the Hebrew text, 
It's not missing from the Hebrew text. You know, I'll hear from a lot of people, oh, the Jews came along and removed the name from the Bible. No, 6,828 times, that's not removed. What we were taught is whenever you see that name, to read it as Lord, as Adonai. So that's tradition, that's not scripture. Now there's an older tradition, one that predates this tradition I was raised with, goes back probably to uh, up until the middle of the second century, and this is recorded in the Mishnah, the writings of the early rabbis. They say a man is required to greet his fellow using the name. Now, I don't quote this as an authority that we're required to do this today. What I'm saying is that this was the original Jewish tradition that predates the tradition of not speaking the name, the one that most Jews today will be familiar with. Now, this tradition that the rabbis talk about here, that a man is required to greet his fellow using the name, they didn't pluck that out of the thin air. They tell us that they took this from the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 4, and there it says, Behold, Boaz was coming from Bethlehem, and he said to the harvesters, Yehovah be with you. And they said to him, Yehovah bless you. That was the greeting in ancient Israel. When someone was coming, you blessed him in the name of Yehovah, in the name of what we later translated as Lord. Does that sound familiar from anywhere? To bless someone who comes in the name of the Lord? And actually in the New Testament, when Yeshua comes, uh, arguably there's a dual meaning there. That he, they're blessing him in the name of the Lord as he's coming in the name of his Father, uh, according to the New Testament, Yehovah. And he's also coming, according to the New Testament, in that name as well. So the New Testament says, is that right? That he they says there he came in the name of his father, which is a pretty neat trick if he never uses that name. How do you come in the name you never speak? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so this earlier tradition predates the ban on the name that we're familiar with from my, that I grew up with. I was taught whenever you see those letters, read them as a different word. This is a, a tomb in the Galilee. And, and how many people have been to this tomb in the Galilee? One man. What is the name of this tomb? Who's buried here? You don't know. And you probably weren't actually there because it's, uh, Keith was there. This is the tomb of a rabbi named Hanania ben Teradion, or Hanina ben Teradion, according to some pronunciations. It's actually on the top of a hill in the middle of nowhere. It's not marked on any maps. Um, it's, you can find out where it's, it's not a secret where it is, but you have to really dig to find that information. And the rabbi who's buried in this tomb is a rabbi who was uh, executed by the Romans. He was martyred. He was actually burned at the stake. We're told by the, by the rabbinical sources that this rabbi was taken and he was wrapped in a Torah scroll and they put wet tufts of, uh, of wool between him and the Torah scroll to slow the burning and then they lit him on fire. And why did they do that according to the Talmud? Because he spoke the name of the Father the way it is written. Whenever he came upon the name Yudhe Vavhe and he was teaching in public, he would proclaim the name Yehovah. And the Romans, in the time of the Hadrianic persecutions, which ended in the year 138, banned the speaking of the name. The tradition not to speak the name comes from shortly after that. And what happened is the rabbis realized if we keep speaking this name, we're going to be put to death. Now, whatever you say about the rabbis, one thing they were very good at is adapting. They saw a threat, and they said, okay, the Romans will kill us if we do this. We're going to do something similar, as best as we can do. When the Messiah comes, he'll drive them out of Israel, and we'll be all fine. And they thought that would happen next week or next month or next year. They didn't think we'd be here 1,600 years later or 1,800 years later still waiting for that, for the Messiah to come and reign as the flesh and blood king over Israel. Another famous example of that is, is, uh, is the calendar. The Romans came and abolished the Sanhedrin, forbade the Jews to proclaim the monthly sighting of the new moon. And what did the rabbis do? They said, we'll adapt. When the Messiah comes next week, he'll, put, restore, uh, he'll restore the original calendar or next month or next year. Until then, we'll follow this approximated cal calculated system. There are rabbis in Israel to this day or in modern times, who say, whenever the Messiah comes, may it be today, they, they pray every day, may it be speedily in our days, we will restore the biblical calendar. So this method of adapting is what brought us the ban on speaking the name. No one ever thought it would last forever, and the rabbis knew it wouldn't last forever because of this verse in Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 9. It says there, Yehovah shall be king over the entire earth, and on that day, Yehovah will be one, say one, and his name will be one, say one. And in that end time, all mankind will call upon his name. There's another verse like this in Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 9. It says there, let me read it. Read it from the Bible. 
don't have a slide for this. Zephaniah 3 9, it's a powerful verse. It says there, Zephaniah is one of those little books hidden away here. Um, Somebody finds it first, please stand. Oh, here it is. Zephaniah 3 9. I'll read it to you from Hebrew. It says, uh, For then I will turn the nations uh, to a pure tongue. And that's a Hebrew expression, a pure language it means. That they will all, to all call upon the name of Yehovah to serve him. And it usually is translated with one accord. It literally says, with one shoulder. It's describing an image of all mankind gathered together, serving Yehovah, standing shoulder to shoulder, calling upon his name in that pure language, the original language, the language from before the Tower of Babylon. If you read in the Torah, you can see very clear that original language is Hebrew. You know, we see all these names of people that their name have, ex remember Yeshua and Yoshia, Yeshua he will save in uh, Hebrew Matthew. You have that throughout the first 10 chapters of Genesis. People who are named things that only make sense in Hebrew. Adam, Eve, Seth, all these people's names are Hebrew names. The original language will be restored when the Messiah comes and sits on the throne of David. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay. Uh, the rabbis admit this. It says this in the Talmud. It says, this world is not like the world to come. When the rabbis say the world to come, in this literature, they're talking about the reign of the Messiah here on earth as a flesh and blood king. They say in this world, the name is uh, written Yehovah and read Adonai. That's the tradition I was raised with. That started in the second century. In the world to come, it will be one. Say one. one. Written Yehovah and read Yehovah. And what's the proof of this? How do they know this? They quote that verse from Zechariah. That's how they know his name will be one. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I want to share something that happened with the name. Yeah, uh, this is when Keith and I were traveling around South Africa. And can we see this slide? Here I'm standing in front of a place called Kayalicha. Say, Kayalicha. Okay, this is the, what they call a township. Say, township. This is a place in South Africa that Keith and I were not supposed to go to. We were not supposed to be there. We were traveling around, speaking of these nice middle-class venues, and all of a sudden... Keith has this burning desire to go and meet with the people living in these townships. Um, <clears throat> these townships, uh, they're very poor places by and large. Kayalicha is a place of 400,000 people living in these shacks with tin roofs. And we were told that by some of the folks that, that in, the, in the winter it gets cold and they heat their houses with kerosene. And they're living in wooden shacks with tin roofs. And sometimes there'll be fires that just sweep through whole areas of it. Uh, burning the whole, burning up people and burning up their possessions and killing people. And I mean, you can't, I can't even imagine what it's like to live there. They have outhouses. And when you're there, you, you smell what that means. You know, seeing it is one thing, seeing the picture, but smelling it, that's really the experience. <clears throat> well, Keith wanted us to go to Kyalicha. And I said, I don't want to, why on earth would I want to go to Kyalicha? That, you know, that, that's not on our itinerary. We had a very tight itinerary. In fact, uh, the lady who um, organized our itinerary over there in South Africa, she said, uh, what would you like to do besides, uh, besides speaking? Would you want to go to Kruger National Park or various other things? I said, let's, any spare time we have, let's fill it up with more speaking venues. I'm not a tourist. I got plenty of tourism in Israel. I'm not going there to see the sites. I want to speak. So we were there for something like, uh, I believe, 16 days, and we had, I believe it was 14 venues. It was insane. I actually completely lost my voice. Um, <clears throat> well, so Keith wants to squeeze in the middle of this some township that I never even heard of. And he didn't have a particular one he wanted to go to. He just said, we need to get to one of the townships, see how the real people live. Um, <clears throat> we were sitting, I remember one evening in this home, and I was, I had a, what I, uh, you know, what you all call, a, in Me when you go to Mexico, you Americans call this Montezuma's Revenge. I... I came to call us in uh, South Africa, Shaka Zulu's Revenge. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so I'm there in South Africa, and I'm suffering from Shaka Zulu's Revenge, and I'm sitting on the, key, uh, on the, on the couch, and I'm holding my stomach, and I'm moaning, and Keith says, we need to go to one of the, the townships. I'm like, oh my, like we just spoke, uh, we drove three and a half hours and spoke for three hours, me two and a half hours of it. And, uh, <laughs> 
and I'm ready to go to sleep. And uh, the man sitting there, um, whose house we were in, he said, well, you guys are driving back tomorrow morning to Cape Town to catch a flight, and I happen to know a Christian pastor who lives in one of the townships. And Keith said, tell me more. Well, the man said, it's a small little township, 400,000 people living in Tin Jacks. Um, <clears throat> Uh, he didn't tell us that part. We found that out later. But it's a, he said it's a little township called Kyalicha. Now, when he said Kyalicha, this man, everyone in the room was muttering and talking, and they were having these conversations. It went dead silence. There was dead silence. And there was one woman there who grew up in Cape Town. And she said in her thick Afrikaans accent, she said, you just go to Kyalicha, and they kill you. And I'm thinking, this is probably not a place we want to go to. I don't think we should be going there. Of course, that only encouraged Keith. I mean, you know, like she couldn't have said anything more to encourage him. So we get over, we uh, make the phone call, and we're talking to this pastor in Kyalicha. We've made the, we have a flight out at something like 9 or 9.30 or 10 a.m. We're supposed to meet him at the entrance of Kyalicha at 7 in the morning. Uh, we can't go into it ourselves because if we take a wrong turn, we're dead. I mean, this is not a place you want to get lost. He meets us at the entrance, and he takes us, and finally we get there, and he's telling us how his church was built, and I mean, it, he actually lived in the back of his brick church, uh, in his tiny little room with his wife and children, in one little room, and he was one step above his neighbors, because they're living in the tin, shack, tin roof shacks with, made of wood, so he is actually brick uh, outside, and uh, he was telling us how the bricks were donated, and the mortar was donated by a second person, and a third person came and mixed them together and, and helped him build the place, and uh, I mean, it was poverty you can't even imagine, and he's telling us the story, and he's so excited and animated, and finally he says, well, tell me about you guys. Where are you from? And I start to tell him, well, you know, I'm from Israel. I've lived there since 1993, blah, 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 and he says, whoa, whoa, whoa stop, stop. Did you say Israel? I said, yeah. I, lived in Jeru I live in Jerusalem, Israel. I have since you know, uh, 93. He says, do you speak Hebrew? And I said, yeah, this is, remember, this is, this is a, a man who is what's known as a Hosa, which is one of the 11 tribes of South Africa, 11 languages of South Africa. And this Hosa man is asking me if I speak Hebrew. And I said, yes, of course I speak Hebrew. I've lived in Israel for you know, many years. He says, starts to tell me, he says, about seven years ago, I had a dream. And in that dream, he says, I, I saw four Hebrew letters. Now, if you tell someone in English, I'm thinking of a four-letter English word. <laughs> you, you're thinking of a cuss word, right? You, say, you tell someone in Hebrew, I'm thinking of a four-letter word. What do you think of? You think of the tetragrammaton, the four-letter name. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And I'm thinking, could it be that God gave this dream to this, uh, this uh, African pastor, a Christian pastor? Remember, I'm Jewish. Christian pastors, as I understand the universe, are not supposed to get visions and dreams, certainly not of the Hebrew name of the God of Israel. Uh, what is going on here? And I say, okay. I say to him, can you write down what you saw? He said, no, I cannot write Hebrew. Uh, and so I said, okay, well, bring me a pen and paper, and I'll write it out, and maybe you can recognize it. He brings the pen, and I start to write out Yud. Say Yud. yud. Hey. hey. Vav. Vav. Hey. And I show it to him. And he looks at it and he says, well, that's kind of what I saw. And as he says that, he's actually writing it in air letters. And I'm thinking, why can't he recognize it? He's actually writing it out right in front of me. Well, what's going on here? And Keith, who's been silent the whole time, he's very patient with me. Uh, he walks over and he looks over my shoulder. And he, and he gives me that look, that quintessential Keith look. Like, what? What? What's it? And he says, what, you know, Nehemiah, he says, I can read Hebrew and I can barely read what you wrote. <laughs> now, it's true, my teachers always complained, I've always had horrible penmanship. So Keith runs out, he actually leaves, the, leaves the, this little brick church, I don't know where he's going. He runs outside and he comes back and what is he carrying? He's carrying a copy of his book uh, and I uh, came to call this book his little study. Because when he originally wrote it, it was essentially a study that he did really for himself. And he calls me up and he says, Nehemiah, I've done some research on the name of our Heavenly Father. Would you look at this little study I've done? And, or maybe I called it little study. And I think I did. Um, <clears throat> over time, this study has grown to where now it's over 200 pages. And it's really a, a monumental masterpiece. You must get this book. Uh, here is the cover. 
and he shows this pastor the cover of his little study, and on it he sees these beautiful Hebrew letters, and, and without hesitation, the pastor, what did he say, Keith? That is what I saw. <laughs> He says, that is what I saw. Those were the four letters. Now, if someone was telling me this story, remember, I'm the skeptic, and God isn't supposed to be revealing his name to Christian pastors. I would doubt this story. To be, I'm totally honest with you. If I hadn't seen it for myself, and more than anything, it was seeing the look on his face. He was clearly recognizing something he'd seen before. And this happened. I'm like, what's going on here? You know, what you did up on the mountain? Okay, I can forgive that. I can forgive you, God, because I'm a Litvak after all. Okay, you know. But why are you revealing your name to a Christian pastor? What are you doing? God, you're out of control. What? Get back in the box. What are you doing? And what this has made me realize is the God of creation is bigger than the boxes that we've created for him. And he's continuing to touch people's lives around the world with his name and with this... this I mean, things are happening that I can't even believe. I mean, I'll talk tomorrow about Smithfield. <laughs> I want to look at this verse in Acts chapter 2, verse 21. It says, And shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is a verse that appears as part of the uh, scene in Acts chapter 2, which is what's known as the Pentecost event. That is the Shavuot uh, that happened 2,000 years ago. You all know what I'm talking about. And this is part of Simon Peter's Pentecost sermon. And in the context of that sermon, 50 days, I guess 53 days after that uh, fateful event, what does this mean when he says the Lord? What Lord is he talking about? And we could probably have debates from now until kingdom come. And the people on this side of the room would say, when he says the name of the Lord, he means Yeshua. And the other side of the people would say, he says the name of the Lord, he means the Father. And how would we ever know? We could, I mean, really, we would never know. We could even start entire denominations. You know, that's what they do. They'll take the most obscure thing and say, okay, because we can't understand this verse and we have our truth that we've received, this is where we're going to draw the line as our denomination. And uh, <clears throat> if we think about this, th what does this mean? We really would never know if we only had this verse. But there's another verse, and that's a verse in the book of Joel. And if you have a good reference Bible, you already know the answer, that Peter was not only quoting this one verse, he was quoting an entire section from the prophet Joel. And in the prophet Joel, what he says, uh, <clears throat> there in Acts says, it shall come to pass that who shall be called in the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Joel it says, it shall come to pass that who shall be called in the name of Yehovah shall be saved. yud heh vav -Hey, the tetragrammaton, that four-letter word. That's the name that it says in Joel. Now when Simon Peter is saying this in Jerusalem on Pentecost and Shavuot, in the Feast of Weeks, is he, presumably he's speaking in Jerusalem next to the temple in Hebrew. Uh, that was the language of discourse in Israel, and certainly it would be the language in the synagogue and when you were giving sermons. And if he's reading Joel, Joel's already in Hebrew. He doesn't have to even translate it. So if he's reading this in Hebrew in the book of Joel, and remember, this is 100 years before that other rabbi was put to death, burned at the stake for speaking the name of Jehovah in public, burned at the stake by the Romans. The Romans martyred him, not the rabbis. Now, what would Peter have been saying in the first century, a hundred years before that rabbi died? Presumably, he'd actually be quoting Joel verbatim, word for word, with the name Yehovah. Now, how can we know for sure? And I guess we can't ever know for sure unless we go back in time. But here's a clue, and I think it's a powerful clue. This is a page from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is actually from a, a, a Dead Sea Scroll from a place called Nachal Hever. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls come from where? Qumran. Qumran is a uh, city on the shore of the Dead Sea. Uh, there's several other places where they found scrolls, some of them from different periods. The ones from Nachochever were placed there in the year 135 during the time of the Bar Kokhba uprising. That was an uprising against the Romans. It was part of the whole Hadrianic persecutions. Here in this uh, scroll, which is actually of Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, through chapter 9, verse 2, and we could probably stop for a minute and talk about chapter 8, verse 23. That's a very uh, important verse. What does it say there in chapter 8, 23 of Zechariah? Someone read it. There it talks about how ten men of all the languages shall grab hold of the Jewish man. Uh, is that right? Okay, that's for another sermon. Uh, here in this Dead Sea Scroll, what I want to talk about is the name. 
And there's actually two words. This is in Greek, the Greek translation of the book of Zechariah. And here there are two words on the page that appear that are not Greek words. Does everybody see those words? You don't have to be a Greek scholar to see these words. It appears here and it appears here. And that is the name Yehovah written in what's called Paleo-Hebrew. Paleo-Hebrew is the original Hebrew script that was used before the Babylonian exile. When the Jews came back from Babylon, they gradually replaced the original Hebrew script with what we call in Hebrew the Assyrian script. That was the script used to write Aramaic, the language of the Gentiles. <clears throat> and at, when they wrote Hebrew, their Hebrew was heavily influenced by Aramaic, and they even used the Aramaic script to write the, their language. But when they came to the name of the Father, they wrote it out in Paleo-Hebrew. Now, why did they do that in the Septuagint? For a number of reasons, but primarily because this name was considered so holy, it couldn't be written out in this Greek language. They decided to write it out in the original language. And uh, the problem came about when Gentile scribes came along. Because remember, this up here, this is a Jewish copy of the book of Zechariah in Greek. Most of the copies we have the book of the book of Zechariah in Greek are Gentile copies from about 200 years later. And almost all of those have replaced the name Yehovah with what by then was standard Jewish tradition, which is calling it, uh, instead of Yehovah, they said Lord. And in Greek, the word for Lord is kurios. Say kurios. And kurios is a very curious word. Not my best material, I admit this. Um, <clears throat> So this word kurios replaces it in most of the manuscripts of the Old Testament in Greek, except for a handful of them, about five of them. And in those handful, it actually has the name of Yehovah written in, not in Paleo-Hebrew letters, but in Greek letters. Now, how did they do that? Let's look and see what they did. They had the name Yehovah. And they said, we can't write this in Paleo-Hebrew letters. No one on earth will know what this is. We've got to replace it with Hebrew letter, with Greek letters. And they said, well, this kind of looks like a, a Greek letter. And so does this. What is this actually? If you read it right to left, this is Yud, He, Vav, He. And they said, okay, the He looks like what Greek letter? What Greek letter does it look like? It looks a little bit like the Greek letter pi, like we use in mathematics to this day, 3.14. And so instead of that, the two Hays, they wrote pi and pi. And in, they didn't know what this was, the Vav, or what this, that was the Yud. And in place of those, they decided, okay, after every consonant in Greek, we have to write a vowel. And the vowels they decided to write were the Greek letter Yota, or Iota, you may know that as. So they ended up with pi, Yota, pi, Yota. And this word in Greek is pronounced pee, -pee. No, I'm serious, pee, -pee. And there are actually several manuscripts of the Old Testament in Greek where it says, And Pepe spoke unto Moses, saying, Thus saith Pepe to the prophets. Even in Greek, this sounded utterly ridiculous. And they said, We've got to get Pepe out of our Bibles. <laughs> and eventually they said, Okay, the Jews have now, under Roman pressure, decided to replace Pepe with Lord, with Yehovah with Lord, with Adonai. So we'll write kurios, this curious word that replaces it. Now, that's a fact that that happened in the Old Testament because we have the documents to show it. What happened in the New Testament? That's speculation. We don't have, you know, I try to stay away from speculation. But certainly we see that happening in the, in, in the Old Testament, and I think it's reasonable to suggest that it may have happened in the New Testament. Either way, even in Greek, what uh, Peter probably, what was written of Peter's words was probably the word Yehovah in Paleo-Hebrew in the original Greek of Acts, which, of course, we don't have. We have copies of copies of copies from 200, 300 years later. <clears throat> um, okay, I want to talk about this for really quickly. And uh, I'm going to try to end early, give Keith a little bit of extra time, because I took so much of his time before. But before that, I want to talk about why I think it's so important. You know, Yeshua preached this message teaching people to sanctify the name of the Father. And when I first started going out with Keith and was talking about this, we had no intention, I had no intention of talking about the name. I thought, well, everybody knows about the name of Yehovah. I don't need to talk about that. There's so many other things. I mean, there's a powerful message of reconciliation, actually, in the prayer. Forgive us the debt of our sins as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. There's so many deep messages there just in that section. In fact, the first time I preached on this, it was on that topic. And, and I didn't even mention this whole issue of the name. And the reason I decided to share this thing on the name is something in this passage in Isaiah 56. And here, 
we get an idea uh, to understand this passage, we have to put ourselves in the mindset of the prophet. We have to put, go back, go back 2,000 years, excuse me, uh, 2,700 years. Isaiah preached in the 8th century BC. Uh, he was very active during the time of the Assyrian invasions in 732 and 721 and 701. Those were the three invasions. He preached before those invasions and after those invasions. And, uh, and his message, he would stand up in the public square, get on top of a soap box, and he would say, thus saith Yehovah. And that's how this prophecy opens. So let's try to put ourselves back 2,700 and plus years in the time of Isaiah and hear his words, thus says Yehovah, keep judgment and do righteousness, for my salvation is close to coming and my righteousness, righteousness to be revealed. By the way, what's the Hebrew word for salvation? Actually, the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. Uh, you might think that's splitting hairs, but it's an important difference. Um, <clears throat> Yeshua is derived from this word, but the word is a slightly different word. Um, my salvation, uh, Yeshua, is close to coming, and my righteousness to be revealed. And then it says, blessed is the man who does it, and the son of man who grabs hold, the son of Adam who grow, grabs hold of it. He who keeps the Sabbath from desecrating it, I'm reading from the Hebrew, and keeps his hand from doing all evil. Now, if you were a Jew and you were walking by in the public square and you heard the prophet standing on the soapbox preaching these words, would you think this applied to you? Presumably you would. There'd be no question that this applied to you. But what if you were a Gentile in Jerusalem at that time? You were one of those eunuchs of the kings who are the ambassadors from all over the world. Jeremiah talks about these, these ambassadors as the, as the way he spread his message to the nations. He would preach to them, they spoke Hebrew, and they would then go out and convey the message all over the ancient world. Well, in Isaiah's time, if you were one of those men, those Gentiles, sent by your king to Jerusalem, or if you were a merchant who had settled in Jerusalem, and you heard the prophet speaking these words, would you think it applied to you? You'd probably think, well, he says man, and he says son of Adam, and it's true I'm a man, and it's true I'm a son of Adam, but he talks about the Sabbath and the covenant. And we know from Exodus that the Sabbath is the sign of the covenant between the God of Israel and the people of Israel. And so you might say to yourself, if you're a Gentile, in the 8th century B.C. hearing Isaiah, that that doesn't apply to me. He's speaking to the Jews, not to me. He's speaking to those people who have a covenant between their God and them. And although I, as a Gentile, may believe in the God of Israel, I have no part of the Sabbath or that people. And many people apparently thought that because the very next words in verse 3 is Isaiah addressing those Gentiles. What it says in verse 3 is it says, he says, let not the son of the Gentile, and the word there is nechar, say nechar. Nechar, they translate as stranger or foreigner. That's the Hebrew word for Gentile, undisputably. Let not the son of the Gentile who joins himself to Yehovah, and the word for join there is very interesting. It's the same root as the word Levite. If you look at the name, the reason for the name Levite, look at the origin of it in Genesis. It has to do with, with jo Leah joining herself to her husband. Here, it's speaking about the Gentiles who join themselves, who Levite themselves, say Levite, who Levite themselves to Yehovah. Let not them say, Yehovah has surely separated me from his people. Because that's what many of them were thinking. I don't really have anything to do with that God uh, or even if I join myself to that God of Israel, I'm not really part of his people. I'm a separate category. I don't belong to his people. He's saying, you must not say that. He then talks about the eunuchs. We'll skip over that for the sake of the children. Um, and go to verse 6. In verse 6 he says, And the sons of the Gentiles who join themselves, who Levite themselves, say Levite, who Levite themselves to Yehovah, to serve him and to love the name of Yehovah to be his servants, all those who keep the Sabbath from desecrating it, and grab hold of my covenant. And this is one of the reasons, this verse, that I decided that I need to go and include this part of Yeshua's message of sanctifying the name. And it was really something that happened now coming on two years ago when Keith and I were speaking over, I believe it was in Colorado, and Keith had talked about the name and I had sort of mentioned it. And then we were sitting in the home of this man afterwards, who was our host there, 
and usually don't put us up in these nice hotels like they do here. We're usually in people's houses. We're in this man's uh, house. Keith was sitting there in the living room with him. I was in the dining room munching on a bowl of shredded wheat, which I like to eat after my presentations. And uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm chomp, 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 and Keith is talking to the man back and forth. And Keith, and they're talking about the name. Now, this man is what I would call, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but he's what I call a Jewabee. Ha, have, have you met some of those people? A Jewabee? A Jew wannabe? And I'm not saying that to insult him. Uh, I guess I'm being a little bit obnoxious. But, um, but what I mean is he loved God. He loved the God of Israel. And being a Christian, he realized, okay, Jesus is a Jew. I want to be like the Jews. Just like that Messianic Gentile I met all those years ago. This man... He wanted to be like the Jews, and he emulated the Jews in all kinds of ways. He even had, the man, the man was in his 70s, and he went at his Messianic congregation. They did a bar mitzvah for him. Now, you have to understand, a bar mitzvah from where I come from is what you do for 13-year-old boys. Um, so this man in his 70s is doing it. Okay, I'm sure for him that was very moving and beautiful. It sounds strange to me, but I could see from talking to him and hearing him, he loved God as much as I love God. And he's sitting there talking to Keith. And he says, when I came into this whole thing of the Hebrew roots, they told me, never speak the name Jesus. Jesus is an evil name. Only call him Yahshua. That's what, they, that's what he was told. I'm not saying that. That's what he was told. And one day he's thinking and he says, if I'm supposed to call the son Yahshua, because that's his true name, so they told him, what should I call the father? And he went to his congregation leaders and he said, you told me to call the son Yahshua. What should I call the father? And they said to him, you don't need to know that name. And I remember he's sitting there and he says this to Keith. They told me I don't need to know that name. And Keith says, it's in your Bible in Hebrew. I wish I could just show it to you. And the man said, but they told me I don't need to know that name. And Keith says, but I wish I could just show it to you. And the man said, they told me I don't need to know that name. And Keith said, I wish I could just show it to you. And I'm eating my shredded wheat, and I'm thinking, oh, God, Keith, just go show it to him. Your Bible's in the other room. Just do it. And then the man got up from his own couch, and he was about to walk out of the room. He was about to walk out of his own living room. And I saw the fear in his eyes, the fear of being confronted with a name that his leaders had told him he didn't need to know, and he shouldn't know, that it was dangerous for him to know that he needed to stay away from and avoid. And when I saw that, it broke my heart. And I made, it made me think of this verse, of this verse which speaks about the son of the Gentile who joins himself to Yehovah, the one who loves the name of Yehovah. That's what it says in verse 6. Who grabs hold of his covenant and keeps the Sabbath. That someone like that would be told not to love the name, to fear the name of the Father, it broke my heart, and I realized when Yeshua taught the multitudes and intended this message to go forth far beyond the Galilee, and he taught them to sanctify the name of the Father, he had an intention there for that name not to be hidden, not to be suppressed, not to be feared, but to be sanctified. Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, the prophecy doesn't end here. In verse 7, it says, And I will bring them to my holy mountain, and I will make them rejoice in my house of prayer. This is the most famous verse in the Bible, am I right? Just about in the Old Testament. I will make them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and uh, peace offerings shall be accepted upon my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Say all nations. all nations. That phrase, the house of prayer for all nations, I mean this whole congregation is named after it. It's one of the most famous verses in the, in the Bible. Most people stop reading here. They got to the famous verse, we're done. But the next verse is the key verse to me. And this is verse 8. <clears throat> now, verse 8, I'm going to publicly share that this is a verse I don't believe. Uh-oh. Michael, you took a big risk. It might have been a mistake. I don't know. But this is a verse I do not believe. And let me read it to you and I'll tell you why. It says, thus says Lord Yehovah, who gathers in the dispersed of Israel, I will gather others into those who I have gathered. And I don't believe this verse. I believe that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And some people think I'm nuts for that. They think, oh, what are you talking about? It was billions of years. I believe with every fiber of my being that he created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Seven, six literal days. That's what I believe. Laugh at me if you want. But I don't know it for a fact. It's a belief. And how do, why don't I know it for a fact? Because I wasn't there. 
and I believe that God took my ancestors out of Egypt and gave us the Ten Commandments on the anniversary of this day, 3,500 years ago. But I don't know it for a fact, because I wasn't there. This verse I don't need to believe, because I've lived this verse. And what I have up here is actually something I stumbled upon by accident. It's a page from, we get the slide. This is a page from a ship's manifest from the USS, it's from the USS Mauritania. That's the name of my great grandfather. And this, this was the, he was listed in the ship's manifest when he arrived at Ellis Island. I, I had no idea that he was it, even went through Ellis Island. I was there on a, I actually had a 12-over stopover in, uh, in New York. And I said, uh, what am I going to do all day? I don't have any money. Uh, I'll go to Ellis Island. That's cheap. And I end up there in Ellis Island. And they, there's a computer. And I go and I look up his name just for kicks. And I find it. And I realize... That this is a... This is the fulfillment of this prophecy. It talks here about God gathering in Israel from the four corners of the earth. And I realize that I've literally been gathered in. I'm privileged to walk the streets of Jerusalem, to breathe the air in Jerusalem. For 2,000 years, my ancestors wandered the globe. They were on boats from this country to that country. Nowhere was their home. And finally, after 2,000 years, I get to live this prophecy. I don't need to believe this prophecy. I've lived it. And I also realized at that time that if my ancestor hadn't been on this boat, I wouldn't be here today. Everyone who, the rest of the family who was left behind in Europe, they're, they're all dead. I actually went to Yad Vashem, the Israel's National Holocaust Memorial, and I typed in the name Gordon. You know, I get a lot of people say, oh, you're Scottish ancestry because you're Gordon. But Gordon's actually a famous name of Lithuanian Jews. And I was curious how many Gordons were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, so I typed in, the, they actually have the names of about half the people killed in the Holocaust. Three million names at Yad Vashem. You can go and type it in on the, I think you can even do it online. And I typed it in the name Gordon there. And it gave a thousand names. And then it, then, it, then it stopped. It said, we only give a thousand names. You know, you have to click for more results to get more. And I thought, if he hadn't been on that boat, I just wouldn't be here today. And it's a f literal fulfillment of this prophecy that he gathered me in from the, from the diaspora, just like he promised 2,700 years ago. I mean, when he said this 2,700 years ago, when Isaiah preached these words in the public square in Jerusalem, my ancestors hadn't even been exiled yet. They said, what is this guy talking about? He's crazy. He gathers into the dispersed of Israel. We're here in Jerusalem. We're going to defeat the Assyrians. We're going to win. And then we'll defeat anybody else who comes. And then they were scattered it's twice. And then gathered back in like he promised. And the reason that this is so powerful, I think, isn't just that he gathered me in and, and saved me and my entire family from, from the ovens of, of Europe. But I'm seeing all over the world, he's gathering in those others. I'm seeing all, on every continent, he's gathering people. And people who can't explain it, they shook the family tree and nothing fell out. There's no Jews that they know of in their ancestry. But something's burning in their heart and it wasn't bad pizza. Something's burning. It's burning in their heart and they know that the God of Israel is calling them to his covenant. And they can't explain why. And it's this prophecy. It's a fulfillment of him. He said, just as I gather in the dispersed of Israel, I will gather others unto those who I have gathered. So this is, this is what we're seeing all over the world. All right. Biblical Foundations Academy is committed to helping people around the world build a biblical foundation for their faith. Visit our website, bfainternational.com, and sign up as a free member of our academy to get instant access to hundreds of online resources and to receive our BFA bulletin. Remember, BFA International depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.